the past, I don't know, decade, past 10 years or so, I feel like superhero movies have made such a big hit. I think it was Iron Man that came out in 2008. I had no idea what was happening. If you're into that, then you probably did your research and you went online and you read up on all this stuff. But Iron Man led to Iron Man 2 and, and it just kind of, and Iron Man 3, and it just kind of led to this floodgates of, of all these superhero movies, right? As soon as, you, as soon as you see that first opening uh, credits or whatever, Marvel, then it starts flipping through all these comics, like you just get excited, right? It, I, didn't, I had no idea, but, but these superhero movies just made this huge, huge hit. And I didn't realize this until Endgame came out, but I've seen every single Marvel movie, except for Captain Marvel, because that was more recent. I've seen every single Marvel movie, and I didn't even try. Like, it wasn't my goal. I just saw all of them, right? And for the most part, they were so good. And it's not even Marvel, right? It's not even how Endgame kind of ended this whole entire series, right? You, we have things like X-Men, which is like my personal favorite. Anyone like X-Men? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I like X-Men a lot, right? And then there's the Justice League, right? They didn't quite hit it, you know, on the head, but still, it's pretty cool. Um, and, and I think that, generally speaking, no matter what time, no matter what kind of culture that you're in, uh, superheroes is something that we always like. We like superheroes. We like people of greater supernatural, even kind of powers, who who kind of serve and benefit society. I think superhero movies are always going to do well because they speak to the human condition. I think superhero movies are always going to do well because they speak to the human condition. They give people something to believe in. People know that evil exists, and people want to know that there is a greater good. We look at superheroes like Superman, and even with all his powers and capabilities to ruin mankind, right, and that's what the struggle is, right, how do we contain this man alien, but he chooses to serve the good and to protect and to do what is good, even if the rest of the world doesn't see it, right, and so we like the idea of Superman, um, and even like Iron Man, for example, I think throughout the Iron Man movies, I think a lot of us are kind of questioning if, if we like this guy, right, he's rich, he's this tech genius, but he's a womanizer, Right, we like to see him on the screen, but if I knew him in real life, he'd probably be a jerk. You know what I'm saying? And so we're kind of asking ourselves, do I like Iron Man until the end of Endgame, right? If you didn't watch Endgame, you're out of luck. Your grace period is over. I'm spoiling everything, okay? Right, he sacrifices himself for the greater good. And at that point, you can't help but say, I like Iron Man. Despite everything he did, he sacrificed himself to save, I don't know, humanity. But what about superheroes like in the movie Brightburn? If you don't know what Brightburn is, it's okay. I barely know what it is. I didn't actually see the movie, so it's impossible for me to spoil it. But Br Brightburn is basically about, very similar to someone like Superman, who has kind of supernatural, extra human powers, but he doesn't use it for the good of mankind. He actually doesn't stand for good. He stands for evil. He doesn't protect he harms. This is what we call an anti-hero. He doesn't stand for good, but he stands for destruction. He doesn't stand to protect, but he stands to harm. So even though he has superhero powers, he functions like an anti-hero. My Apple Dictionary defines anti-hero like this. A central character of a story who lacks conventional heroic attributes. A central character of a story who lacks conventional heroic attributes. Judges has been a downward spiral of sin, darkness, failure, and destruction of God's people. I showed you that cycle. It's just this constant, constant cycle of being under oppression. God provides a judge. They go into repentance. They go into period of celebration and fruitfulness, and what do you know? They're back into idolatry again. They're back under the oppression of other, nat of other nations. Just constant, constant cycle of darkness and failure, and what we're going to see today is the last judge. His name is Samson, and what we're going to see today about Samson is that he is the anti-hero. This guy is the epitome of an anti-hero. He had a miraculous birth. 
had extraordinary physical powers. He does not stand for good. He does not stand for what God stands for. This guy, in light of all the judges in the book of Judges, this guy is a cherry on top. And he is the last of the judges, and he will show us what's at hand in the story of Israel. But there's a light at the end of the tunnel. I usually end the sermon like this, but I'm going to start it like this. Go to Judges 13, and this will give us the beginnings of Samson. Judges 13, verse 1, And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord gave them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. There was a certain man of Zorah for the tribe of the Danites, whose name was Manoah. And his life was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, you are barren and have not borne children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Therefore be careful and drink no wine or strong drink and eat nothing unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb. And he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. Then the woman came and told her husband, A man of God came to me, and his appearance was like the appearance of the angel of God. Very awesome. I did not ask him where he was from, and he did not tell me his name. But he said to me, Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. So then drink no wine or strong drink, and eat nothing unclean, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Church, what's the point of Judges? What is the point of this dark, dark book? It's all about God's people failing. It's about failure after failure after failure. And the thing is, it's not just God's people. These are the leaders of God's people. Isn't it hard? Isn't it hard when we hear about our heroes, our leaders, our pastors, our elders, our Bible study teachers, people who are leading the faith, people who are in charge and overseeing the evangelical movement of God, and they have moral failure? It's hard to see that. And, and I, I think that we have to understand that when, even when the Bible treats leadership, yeah, we like to treat them as not putting them on a pedestal because we want to put God on a pedestal, but we can't help that because even the Bible makes this clear distinction between leaders and members. The Bible makes a clear distinction between leaders and non-leaders, and the Bible will even say teachers are held to a higher accountability. There's this, there's this extra kind of higher standard that God has on leaders and the struggle of every superhero the struggle of every leader is that you you establish years and years and years of credibility you work hard to serve you work hard to influence to push God's people in the right direction you have one hiccup you mess up once and then what happens all of that just comes crashing down when we see the downward spiral of failures and sins the only and this only intensifies our need for a savior. That's the point of judges. The greatness of our failures point us to the coming of a great redeemer. And this redeemer is the ultimate superhero who will come and not fail us. And the reason I say that is because what we're seeing here is the making of an anti-hero who points us to the real superhero. Samson is born miraculously. If you've been reading the Bible, you've been coming out to church and you're hearing sermons, you know that miraculous birth means something. Abraham and Sarah, they're both old. Abraham's like 100 years old. His wife, Sarai, before she starts, she is old. God promises a son. They laugh at God. God delivers. Sarah has a son. They name him Isaac. That's miraculous. Look at the book of Samuel. The Bible actually says that Hannah's womb was closed. If you were a woman living back in that day and culture and you couldn't bear babies, that is one of the the most difficult things to bear with in life. That is an incredible shame and incredible dishonor on your family. Women back then were actually considered second-class citizens. So if you as a woman couldn't bear children, what is your purpose in this life? Why do you exist in this family and in this culture? You have literally have nothing to contribute to society. You can't work, you can't vote, you can't own land. What are you going to do as a woman if you can't produce children? But God shows grace. God blesses her. And she bears birth to Samuel. 
It's like this identity being restored in her. Jump to the New Testament, right? Think Christmas. We see Elizabeth and Zechariah. Same thing. Elizabeth is barren. God shows her grace, and they give birth to John the Baptist before he was John the Baptist. He was just John, right? God's handprints are all over these miraculous births. Do you hear me? God's handprints are all over these miraculous births. These aren't random coincidences. They are miraculous workings of God. In the same way, God's handprints are all are over these miraculous births. God's handprints are also all over Samson's birth. Because Manoah's wife is barren and God blesses her with Samson. So listen, this is what we need to hear. There's something we have to understand about God. I'm not preaching just from the text, but I think this is something we need to hear. Do you realize God does not exist for you? God does not exist like he's a Santa Claus. God does not exist uh, like he's your personal Netflix. You just kind of pull up whenever you're bored. God does not exist as, as kind of your, your personal entertainment system. God exists for his own glory, whether you choose to be part of that or not. You exist, we exist for God. So when God performs miracles, right, and the Gospel of John makes this really clear, when God performs miracles, he doesn't do it so that we as God people can kind of sit back and watch Netflix and be like, wow, that's so awesome. Wow, God, do it again. Here's my quarter. Do it again, God. That's not why God exists. God exists for his own glory. So when God performs a miraculous birth, that miraculous birth points to another God miracle. A miraculous spiritual birth by God points to a miraculous spiritual birth. Do you hear me, church? The miraculous physical points to the miraculous spiritual, which means what? A redeemer is coming. And you look at all these guys, all these faithful guys who do, do these mad, crazy stuff, living for God, doing awesome things, they still only fulfill to a certain extent what the ultimate hero would do. These guys point us to Jesus. That's what we need to see. Jesus Christ is the hero that all of the heroes are pointing to. What's the point of Judges? Judges intensifies our picture of sin so that in turn our need for a Savior is that much more intensified. This book is critical to our faith. This book speaks about our depravity. It forces us to look into the spiritual mirror so that we can say, wow, I am indeed in need of a Savior. So, what then makes Samson such an anti-hero? Why is, is Samson considered so bad? Like, what is bad about his life, really? Go to, go to chapter 14. We're not going to read all four chapters of the Samson narrative. I'm just going to pick out and highlight four different flaws of Samson. Judges chapter 14, verse 1. Samson went down to Timnah, and at Timnah he saw one of the daughters of the Philistines. Then he came up and told his father and mother, I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines at Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. It's respectful, right? But his father and mother said to him, is there not a woman among the daughters of your relatives or among all our people that you must go take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? But Samuel, I'm sorry, Samson said to his father, get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. So, examine this. Think about this. What's so wrong about pursuing a woman that you desire? I mean, that's what we're supposed to do, right? No one marries, no man marries a woman and says, I don't desire you. That's why I'm marrying you, right? That's terrible. Right, even for a Christian, of course you're going to pursue women that you desire. But what's so sinful about what's happening here? Okay, let's let's think Asian, right? Most of us, if not all of us, were Asian, and we know that as Asians, compared to a lot of other cultures, the honor shame thing, especially in our family, that's huge. Right? We're we're Korean American, right? So we're Korean and we're American. What do we believe as Americans? Individualism, freedom, pursue what you want to pursue, do what makes you happy. And what do we believe as Koreans? Do what makes your family happy, please your parents. So we're stuck in between. It's not just the best of both worlds, it's also the worst of both worlds. And so what we understand, what we're stuck in between, is that, well, my parents want me to marry this woman, and so it's a dishonor to my parents if I marry the woman I want to marry. And so this is a little bit of what Samson understands. So we have a keen understanding of this, and so what we understand is that Samuel is dishonoring his parents. 
There's a cultural lens to that, but that's what he's doing. Not just in his decision, but even the way he talks to his parents. It's not just the fact that he's dishonoring his parents. It's a reflection of his character. You notice his father, is, it's not even, he's not even demanding like a lot of our fathers do. His father is providing good, godly counsel. Don't you think it would be wise, Samson, to consider someone from your own people, not a Philistine? No. No. She is right in my eyes. What we have to understand is that Samson is not teachable. Samson doesn't receive correction. He doesn't even consider good, godly, wise counsel. This is an issue of pride. This is an issue of pride. If you don't have older people in your life that you can receive wise counsel from, I think you need to look in the spiritual mirror and ask yourself, do I struggle with pride? Just because he's older? Just because he, he has more experience? Well, he can tell me what to do? It's an issue of pride. Second, what's wrong with marrying a Philistine woman? Because that's the woman that he wants to marry. And the father is speaking against that. Philistines were pagans. They were idol worshipers. Spiritually speaking, he wasn't just dabbling with sin. He wanted to marry it. So keep things simple. This is what he's doing. Samson, a chosen people of God, is purposely going out. He doesn't want to dabble with it. He doesn't want to flirt with her. He wants to marry her. That's like saying, in one hand, I'm grabbing my sin, and I'm going to do with what I want with my sin, and on the other hand, I'm just going to give the finger to God. That's what that means. One hand is my sin, I'm marrying it. The other hand, I'm giving, I'm giving the finger to God. Right? This is a disregard of God and his holiness. Samson is not an idol worshiper from another nation. He is a people of God in Nazarite. Go to Judges 14, verse 5. Then Samson went down with his father and mother to Timnah, and they came to the vineyards of Timnah, and behold, a young lion came toward him, roaring. Then the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and although he had nothing in his hand, he tore the lion in pieces as one tears a young goat. But he did not tell his father or his mother what he had done. Then he went down and talked with the woman, and she was right in Samson's eyes. After some days, he returned to take her, and he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, there was a swarm of bees in the body of the lion and honey. He scraped it out with his hands and went on eating as he went. And he came to his father and mother and gave some to them, and they ate. But he did not tell them that he had scraped the honey from the carcass of the lion. Third, what's wrong with eating from a carcass? Bear Grylla does it all the time, right? That guy is the man. Here's the issue. Bear Grylls is not a Nazarite. <laughs> Samson is. What we have to understand about Nazarites, and we get this from number six, is that God speaks to Moses, and, and he gives these crystal clear guidelines of what specifically Nazarites were supposed to do. It was called the Nazarite vow, and it boils down to three things. Don't cut your hair. Don't drink alcohol. Don't touch dead bodies. And I want you to understand something. God is not about that slavery life. You feel me, church? God is not about bondage. God is not about restrictions. God is not about making your life miserable, a a despite what we might think. Now, some of us, we won't disagree with that out loud because we know that's not right to say, but inside we just think, well, God is putting these restrictions in my life on purpose and, and he's making my life unhappy. Like, I don't understand why God would do that. And so we'll twist God's word in a way that justifies our actions so that we can still kind of be Christian, but still live the lives that we want. Because some of us, even as Christians, we just can't accept the fact that the Bible teaches against homosexuality. Especially in this day and age, we, it's just, we just can't accept it. Like, we know it's there, it's clear as day, but it's like we just can't accept it. And it's just too restricting. And so we'll twist it, we'll justify it. Some of us just don't treat premarital sex that seriously. Why would God restrict my happiness? I know it's bad, but it's not so bad. Why can't I just do what feels right to me? Isn't that the language that the Bible is using with Samson? It's right in his eyes. Some of us don't really see any problems with getting drunk. I've had a stressful week. It's my body. I'm entitled to a little bit of relaxation. Why can't I just have a good time? Church, 
God isn't about slavery. He's about freedom. If you had a five-year-old child who was about to cross the street and there was a car speeding directly at your child, are you going to grab, are you going to say, child, my son, my daughter, come here, and the child goes, you don't want what's happy, you don't want what's happiness for me. You're just trying to ruin my life and make me unhappy, and you're going to cause all this kind of slavery. And so you're like, all right, child, it's all about the freedom life, no restrictions, do you. And then what happens, your child ends up either dead or in the hospital, paralysis, broken bones. You call that freedom? Are you so short-sighted that you can't see that God is putting fences around your life to protect you? You feel me, church? That's the kind of God that we have. And that's what he's doing to Samson. A Nazarite vow that would say, you're not going to do these things. It's not about slavery. It's not about restriction. It's about so you will be set apart from the rest of the world. So your focus and your affection would be me. So don't cut your hair, don't drink alcohol, and don't touch dead bodies. What does Samson do? All three, baby. All three. He doesn't doesn't even hesitate. He just goes for it. Samson has no regard for the Lord. This is an issue of holiness. Samson is prideful. doesn't listen to counsel. Samson doesn't regard God as his God. He doesn't even pursue holiness. Go to Judges chapter 15. You can just look at that for the sake of time. I won't read all of this, but what happens is, and this is crazy, Sam, Samson wants to be with his wife, even through all his adultery and his womanizing, and just his fleshly, sexually desires, he just goes for it. And his father says, I really thought you hated your wife because of all the women you're sleeping with, so I gave her to your companions, which really aren't his companions. And so he gets all, walks away, he's all butthurt, and he's angry, and he's bitter, and so you know what he does is crazy. He catches 300 foxes, He lights their tails on fire, and he sets them to the Philistines, and he burns their wheat and their olive trees. Like, I'm thinking about this. I'm like, what kind of psycho do you have to be? This is creative. This is creative. Like, he gets points for being creative. Like, you ever have friends growing up, especially if you're a boy, you had that, like, psychotic friend who did bad things. Everyone did bad things, right? But he was, like, creative at it. And if you're like, I never had a friend like that, it's because it was you. (laughs) You were that crazy, creative, evil kid. You know what I'm saying? Like, Greg has all kinds of stories. I don't mean to pick on him. He was that evil, crazy, creative kid redeemed by grace. Praise God. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? He's leading worship. Like, you know what I'm saying? This is exponential, creative, you know, adolescence. This is straight-up animal cruelty. If he did this today, instantly he'd be thrown in jail. And so the Philistines are talking, who, who lit these 300 foxes on fire and burned our wheat and our olive trees? And they find that at Samson, and so they retaliate. You know what they do? They find Samson's wife, Samson's father, and they burn them alive. This is an issue of self-control. Samson is impulsive. Does what he wants, when he wants, to whoever he wants, however he wants to do it. And this isn't explicitly in the text, but fourth, do you know what we see throughout all of this? Or what we don't see throughout all of this? It's not what Samson does, it's what he doesn't do. Samson has no friends. He is running solo this entire time. Samson has no community. The language that we use is Samson has no small group. No one to warn him. He has no one to speak truth into his life. He has no one to tell him that there are major red flags with the decisions that he's making. And when he commits these sins, he has no leader, no community to sit him down and say, hey, what you're doing is wrong. This is not what God desires for you. Church, we need to learn from this. We need to learn what not to do. You see, if you take the world's definition of what a man is, here you go. Culturally, this is what manhood is. Samson is the definition of man according to our culture. Why? He's physically strong. He gets any woman he wants. He kills a lion with his bare hand. That's on my checklist, right? Like, that's on my bucket list. Like, how do you do that? 
and then he just runs solo. I don't need anybody to tell me what to do. I'll figure out my own issues. You can't tell me what to do. My parents are telling me to watch out for the Philistine women. Proverbially speaking, F my parents, F God. I'm going to do what I want, when I want, to whoever I want, however I want. Church, listen to me. We think that courage is defined by running solo. We think that courage is all about me figuring out everything on my own. And to an certain extent, of course you do. Of course you have the empowerment and the wisdom and everything God has given you to make wise decisions in your life. But courage, listen to me, courage is not defined by running solo. Courage is defined by asking for help. It's the, it's, it's the, it's the opposite. The most courageous thing that you can do as a Christian is to ask for help. Think about that. You have to be courageous because you have to admit, I don't have everything figured out. You have to admit, I need people to speak truth into my life. You have to admit, I have darkness and depravity and failures in my life, and I need to link arms with people around me, people I trust, so that they can tell me to not light 300 foxes on fire, to not go around sleeping with different women, to tell me that maybe I should give heed to the parents, to the counsel of my parents. I need someone to sit me down and tell me, hey, you need to stop giving God the finger and you need to start obeying what he's saying. So let's add this up. Samson is prideful. Samson has no pursuit for holiness. Samson is impulsive. And Samson has no community. Here's what we need to be concerned about. One of the keys for interpreting the Old Testament is that the individual represents the whole. It's an entire layer of, of interpretation that when you study the Bible, we call it hermeneutics, when you study the Old Testament, you don't just take it for what it is, you examine it, and you understand there's actually layers of, of interpretation. For example, if you look at King David, right, before he was king and he, and, he, and, he, um, and he slayed Goliath, that wasn't just a story about David, that was a story about Israel, right? It wasn't just David defeating, defeating uh, Goliath. It was about Israel, God's people, defeating the Philistines. So when we look at this story, we're not just looking at the story of Samson. We're looking at the story of Israel. So hear me when I say this. The spiritual condition of Samson was the spiritual condition of Israel. Samson's pride represents Israel's pride. Samson's disregard for holiness represents Israel's disregard for holiness. What we see here isn't just the failure of a man, but it's the failure of an entire nation of God's people. Are you stirred to think about life stream? It, it does something to my heart when I think about our church, because now it's real. that me being one of the leaders here, many of you being the leaders, all of you, most of you being members, that you somehow represent the greater whole, that you affect the body, that what you say, what you do, your tendencies, the condition of your heart, the condition of your spirit, the condition of your, of your spiritual life, it somehow represents the body. If you're a member here, let me remind you of something. And I'm not preaching at you, I'm preaching at us, man. We're in this covenant relationship together. We're in this together. This is not my church, this is not your church. This is God's church given to us as a gift. Which means that church is not a burden. Despite the brokenness, despite torn relationships, despite hurt, despite all the crap and all the failures and all the darkness, church is still not a burden. It is a gift. It's the beloved bride of Christ. We're called to protect this community. We're called to pursue holiness as a community. We're called to tap into God's grace to bring restoration in all the jacked up brokenness of this community. And we have to be crystal clear on this because of what happened next. Let's go to chapter 16. 
16, verse 1. Samson went to Gaza, and there he saw a prostitute, and he went into her. That's nice. Verse 2. The Gazites were told, Samson has come here. And they surrounded the place and set an ambush for him all night at the gate of the city. They kept quiet all night, saying, Let us wait till the light of the morning, then we will kill him. But Samson lay till midnight, and at midnight he arose and took hold of the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts and pulled them up, bar and all, and put them on his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that is in front of Hebron. After this, he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, Seduce him and see where his great strength lies and by what means we may overpower him, that we may bind him to humble him. And we will each give you 1,100 pieces of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, Please tell me where your great strength lies and, he, and how you might be bound that one could subdue you. Samson is strong. Samson is freakishly strong. This guy grabs the, the gate doors, puts them on his shoulders, and marches up the hill. You ever seen strongman competitions? They put a bar over and they carry like refrigerators. You ever seen that? Like that happens. You know what I'm saying? Uh, this is like times 50 of that, right? He, he pulls the gates out of the ground, posts and all. You see how the scripture spells it out? Bar and all, everything. And he goes up. Do you know how far he goes? This is like a CrossFit workout times 100. Gaza to Hebron, it's 40 miles. 40 miles carrying these gates over his shoulder. This guy is freakishly strong. Rich Froning has nothing on this guy. Okay? So he, and then he falls for this Philistine woman, you idiot. Her name is Delilah. I wouldn't call it love. I would call it infatuation. I would call it lust. And if Delilah can figure out the source of Samson's strength, then she'll get paid. So she asks. I should have read this better, right? Please tell me where your great strength lies. Oh my gosh, you're so strong. That you might be bound, that no one can subdue. Whatever the interpretation is, right? Delilah, she's working it to get paid. So this guy is freakishly strong, but he's freakishly stupid because this happens three times. She says, tell me the source of your strength, and he lies. It happens three times until finally he fesses up. Verse 18, when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called the lords of the Philistines, saying, come up again, for he has told me all his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money in their hands. She made him sleep on her knees, and she called the man and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. Then she began to torment him, and his strength left him. And she said, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times and shake myself free. This might be one of the most tragic verses in all the Old Testament. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. And the Philistines seized him and gouged out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with bronze shackles. And he ground at the mill in the prison. Can God use antiheroes? We know that leaders fail. As much as we don't like seeing leaders fail, we know that they do. As much as we don't like seeing God's people fail, we do. Every single one of us in this room has failed and will continue to fail. Every single one of us in this room has vices. Every single one of us in this room has addictions. Every single one of us in this room have, has a, a sinful tendencies. In this room alone, in this room alone, there is pride, there is lust, there is malice, there is substance abuse, there is judgmentalism, there is slothfulness, there is anger. In this room alone, if 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 you're not one of them, you're all of them. And it's not just single, individualized, compartmentalized sins, but there are these weird hybrids of sins. Lust and power all coming together, substance abuse and judgmentalism all coming together in this weird hybrid form to make this uglier sin 
and, and, it, and, it, and it hinders our relationship with God. And so the burning question we ask is, can God use us in our failures? Does God still function or does he leave us completely? Is God still present in our lives, even in the dark season that I'm in? Hear me, church. Abraham was a failure. Was he not? Instead of holding on to the faithful promises of God, Sarah, who's supposed to be his helper, his mate, his supporter, she says, go sleep with the servant so that you can have a baby. And what does Abraham do? Okay. God is still faithful. God still used Abraham. King David was a failure. Listen to me. The king was a failure. Had a weakness for women, just like Samson. God still used him. Peter was a failure, a coward. God used Peter. Paul was a Pharisee, a failure. He made a religion a savior. God used him. In the same way God used the failure of these men for his greater glory, God used Samson for his greater glory. And in the same way God used the failure of this anti-hero, God can use us. And may we not get it twisted. This does not give you a, a permission to go and pursue sin. But rather, the point is to admit your failures, to surrender your life to God for, for God to redeem and use. Because after all his failures, Samson, for once, finally gives this honest prayer and confession. In verse 28, he says, Samson called to the Lord and said, Oh, Lord God, please remember me. Please strengthen me only this once, O oh God, that I may be avenged on the Philistines for my two eyes. There's still sin in this prayer, but at least it's honest. At least there's a confession. Finally, something real. It took all these failures, all those sins, all that pride, all that impulsiveness to finally come to a place where he can say, God, save me. Verse 29, Samson grasped the two middle pillars on which the house rested, and he leaned his weight against him, his right hand on the one, and his left hand on the other. It reminds us of someone, doesn't it? Verse 30, and Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. Then he bowed with all his strength, and the house fell upon the lords and upon the people who were in it. So the dead whom he killed at his, at his death were more than those whom he had killed during his life. An anti-hero is a central character of a story who lacks conventional heroic attributes. So then, what is a hero? A central character of a story who doesn't lack conventional heroic attributes, but fulfills them, but displays them, but completely, 100%, embodies the attributes of heroism. In other words, a hero isn't someone with pride, but with humility. A hero isn't someone who disregards God, but someone who embodies holiness and perfect obedience. A hero isn't someone who is impulsive, but, but someone who practices perfect self-control. What does this tell us? We like heroes because heroes speak to the human condition. Heroes give people something to believe in. We know that evil exists and we want to believe in a greater good church. The point of judges is that Jesus is the greatest good. We see the failures of our people and our leaders. We see the failures of this ultimate anti-hero to point us intensely to the coming Savior King who will be the ultimate hero. Samson gave in and he entertained Jesus during his trial. He stood his ground. Samson brought down the temple, defeating the Philistines. Jesus came down from the cross and defeated Satan. Samson died because of his disobedience, Jesus died despite his perfect obedience. Because of our disobedience, Samson died with arms wide open. Did you catch that, church? Jesus Christ died, arms wide open, but on the cross. When Samson died, he died. When Jesus Christ died, he resurrected. Amen? Come on, church, he resurrected. What is the point of judges? What is the point of of looking at failure after failure after failure, looking at the darkness and depravity and evil of God's own people. It points us to the cross. It points us to Jesus, the hero of all heroes. So what is now our calling? What does God desire? Surrender. 
instead of trusting in your own hero complex, in your own desire to save yourself, you surrender. This is not something I could do on my own. Even in all my giftedness, even in all my strength, there is a greater someone, a coming king. There is a real hero, a real king. Judges is not the end of the story. We have to see that. The point of judges is for us to see the reality and the depth and the intensity of our sin so that we can see the need intensely for the coming king who will save us and who has saved us. Pray with me.